Do you think that generative AI needs to go on a diet? Some people do. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider YouTube channel and podcast, where we talk about the truth of cloud computing and how to make it work for your enterprise. I'm your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, b geek, and here to guide you through what cloud computing can do for you and also what it can't do for you. Well, first, just kind of talking about the channel, uh, past 90,000 subscribers a couple of weeks ago, uh, heading up to 100,000 subscribers. That's a big milestone. Uh, I've been doing this for about six months now, and it's just going great. Um, I'm loving the feedback I'm getting from you guys. Thank you very much for uh, subscribing. Thank you very much for watching the videos. Thank you very much for sharing this with other folks who were looking to learn about cloud computing and getting beyond the hype into the real aspects of this technology in terms of how to make it work ultimately and what are the information or the core tricks that we need to leverage to make this more viable for our enterprises. So I couldn't done it, I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much. Channel's going like crazy and I'm looking forward to the next many years. So this kind of came from a few articles and I'll link them in the description below. We're, we're talking about uh, CIOs kind of pushing back on the hype around generative AI and having trouble to find, you know, some of the use cases where we're using full-blown large language models to solve a particular business problem. And the CIOs are coming up with what you would think they would find. It's very difficult to find a particular business case within an enterprise where utilization of an LLM is going to bring back a very obvious business value. And so they're pushing back a little bit on the industry's push to get them to start executing more on generative AI. And of course, we have a lot of it going on. People are doing proof of concept prototypes. Uh, every cloud conference, as I mentioned, is a generative AI conference. And that's going to keep on for a while. But also, I think we need to take a pragmatic view around what we can do with this technology and also what we can't do with this technology. So it's, uh, I think, interesting that we're normalizing our expectations now, probably about two years into the hype curve for generative AI. So what's occurring now is that large language models are full-blown generative AI systems that the industry is asking the CIOs to build for their enterprises are becoming a bit too expensive, a bit too heavyweight. Uh, in other words, they need to lose some weight. So LLMs, as we may have discussed here before, are advanced AI models that are trained to understand and generate human-like text. That's what generative AI is. And they are be built with deep learning art architectures, such as transformers, and are trained on vast amounts of data, but such as chat GPT, is, which, which is trained on the whole data in the, on the internet, often encompassing billions of parameters. And this intensive training enables them to perform a wide range of language-related tasks. And that's why we can ask chat GPT to write a song about us, to write our bio, write our resumes. Uh, do any number of things just because it's been trained with a huge amount of information. And so due to their size and complexity, LLMs require significant computational research to train and operate them. They're very expensive to build and deploy. And I think that's what the CIOs are pushing back on, as well as not necessarily finding a, a legitimate, obvious business case for leveraging an LLM. And let's take a look at what it takes to build um, an LLM like chat. GPT-3. Uh, it's estimated that the training model like GPT-3 could cost around $5 million to build. That's to build a single instance of the model. And whether you do it in cloud or on-premise, it's about the same amount of money. And training large language models like chat GPT can take several weeks to a few months. And so this is getting into territory that most enterprises aren't going to want to get into. Now, it doesn't mean all enterprises aren't going to want to build these very elaborate large language models, because I think a lot of enterprises out there are going to build them as innovative differentiators for their particular industry that they're in. In other words, they're able to build something that the competitors don't have that gives them unique advantages in the industry, you know, such as ride sharing programs, the ability to leverage AI to uh, make finding people who need rides and people who are offering rides in an efficient way, the ability to, you know, deal with uh, house sharing programs, the ability to look at logistics uh, and training programs, the ability to look at any number of things where the utilization of an LLM 
may provide a strategic advantage where the $5 million it's going to take to build these things and a month to build these things may be worth it. Um, but most enterprises out there, tire manufacturers, um, uh, professional service providers, automobile manufacturers, retailers, things like that, aren't necessarily going to have the need for these large use cases where you need to train an LLM with lots of information, which is going to cost a huge amount of money. So limitations associated with these are going to be high computational needs and associated costs. We just talked about that. It's expensive to build and deploy these things and scalability concerns. In other words, we're going to, it's going to need a tremendous amount of power, a tremendous amount of resources, including server resources to build some of these things that's going to come near the capabilities of some of the LLMs we see out there in the commercial world, like ChatGPT, Chat GPT, Gemini, you know, a, a bunch of them that are out there that we're leveraging every day, that we're leveraging as a service. So if we're leveraging as a service, we're only paying for a ticket to use those LLMs for a very short period of time. So we're not funding the training of those systems. We're not providing massive amounts of data to train them. We're not having to secure them. So if we're going to build those things ourselves within the enterprises, we have to take on a huge amount of responsibility and a huge amount of cost. And that's where the problem comes in. So the idea is really to pivot to what are called small language models. And they are represented what I call lean AI because they're not necessarily using uh, large AI systems out there. They're very tactical models that are solving particular niche problems, niche business problems. They may take an hour to train. They may take uh, $100 to uh, uh, train the system. They may use, uh, you know, say, a half a petabyte of information versus versus millions of petabytes of information like, like the large language models out there like ChatGPT. But they're very tactically focused. They do something to apply to a particular niche problem domain, supply chain management, um, uh, inventory control, you know, any number of small business problems that we're dealing with within the enterprise and using AI as a mechanism to provide us with additional value to make these systems more smarter, able to respond to uh, changes in the business model, able to re respond to things like changes in demand and do so in a much more agile and much more intelligent way where they learn as they go. So small language models carry forward many of the same benefits of, as large language models, but they only have a limited amount of knowledge because they're trained on a limited amount of data. So they reduce the number of parameters, making them more efficient to train and deploy and smaller size. They can uh, achieve proficiency uh, like text generation, classification, summarization, and even provide advantages like faster processing, lower power consumption. We can run them on smaller servers. And as I mentioned, you know, training a small language model may take $100 and cost, and cost you an hour of time, where obviously the large language models we just talked about, not that, much bigger. And so they are suitable for integration into different applications and different niche problems that are out there to solve. So this is what Lean AI is all about. It's about looking at AI using a much more pragmatic set of expectations and looking at it as more of a tactical application for particular niche business problems. We're not trying to build chat GPT for the business. And I don't think it, that was ever uh, a potential possibility. I think the industry sold enterprises as doing something like that. Obviously something not as big as that, but something, um, you know, maybe a million dollars to train the model, you know, versus $5 million to train the model and uh, it taking a week versus taking a month. Um, however, those kinds of applications and those kind of use cases for AI are going to be too heavyweight for most enterprises out there. So we're looking for more lean solutions, lean AI, which is what small language models are, or even doing things like agentic AI or getting back into um, machine learning based systems. All of that stuff is still on the table that we're able to leverage to solve our particular business issues. You got to remember, it doesn't necessarily have to be generative AI. We can use any number of types of AI. Uh, and also not AI. Uh, AI doesn't necessarily need to be mandated for a lot of these systems, and some people think think it is. Again, you have to have a use case for it. You know, one of the things I always tell my um, generative AI architecture students 
is that AI has to prove itself. We never pick it by default. So we look for opportunities to use traditional technology to solve these issues. And if we can't, maybe AI is going to be a better fit, but it has to pay its own way. It has to have some sort of a business value that it's able to produce for us. So small language models and lean AI initiatives provide lots of different benefits and more cost efficiency, uh, you know, obviously more sustainability and the ability to, I think, to provide more, um, more value for the enterprises that are out there. So then we get into the notion of lean AI. And, and by the way, lean AI doesn't necessarily need to be generative AI, small language models. It can be agentic AI. It can be machine learning based systems. It can be very tactical use cases for deep learning environments, things like that. So it, it just focuses on smaller and more efficient models that offer some core advantages for the business. Number one, reduce computational cost. Uh, by a lot, normally, uh, if we're using these things in very tactical use cases. Uh, it's very um, value-oriented in terms of our ability to leverage computational resources. And those could be in the cloud or on-premises. Improve scalability. We're able to scale them pretty easily because they're not doing a lot. They're not doing as much as a traditional LLM. And also you have faster deployment and response times that come from these uh, lighter weight AI, AI deployments. In other words, it's going to come back in a uh, sub-second response time instead of something that may take a few seconds in dealing with an LLM. Environmental benefits, we're not heating the planet up and using excessive power. And if you look at what everybody thinks is going to be built in the next 10 years in terms of generative AI and the amount of power that we're generating on the planet right now, the math doesn't add up. We're not going to get there. And so we're going to have to be a, a little bit more conservative uh, in our growth of data centers, our growth of power consumption, things like that. And also accessibility, your ability to integrate these things into any number of applications on any number of platforms and have any number of applications reach out to them. So it's not going to be this a large language model system, which is on this uh, big honking collection of servers that sits on a cloud provider, for example. Um, we can move these things around to different platforms as we need to. We can make them accessible in different ways. They're easier to integrate into other systems. And if we're doing something like, say, a supply chain integration a uh, small language model, for example, to make decisions around logistics planning, um, we're able to integrate those in our inventory control system. We're able to integrate those in other partner supply chain management systems and do so in an easy way because we're not uh, mandating that we use this hugely expensive uh, and hugely uh, power-hungry environment. We're doing so in a much more smaller tier of services, which I think is going to be a smarter deployment for most enterprises. So where is this all going? Well, we're, I think we're finally getting AI to work for the business. Smaller investments, less time to deploy, uh, able to get to the business value quicker. Uh, I don't think that any of the larger enterprises out there were going to get any value from deploying LLMs, typically to the size that I think the industry wants them to deliver. Uh, however, the industry needs to respond to that. The industry needs to probably stop as much selling as to these heavyweight AI models uh, out into the environment and selling the promises of that and look for more tactical deployments. We're already seeing interest in agentic AI, which is basically using AI agents that can run any number of places and distribute and they can be self-distributing themselves. It's kind of another uh, rabbit hole unto itself. And I got some stuff out there on agentic AI you may want to check out. But ultimately, this is about doing things that are more efficient. It's working from the smaller to the larger. In other words, we're starting out with tactical use cases, tactical utilization of generative AI systems, and we're building up to the larger deployments. We're not starting with the large deployments and then realize it's too expensive and have to disassemble it and break it down to uh, smaller components. We're doing so in a reverse order, which is go typically going to be a path of success. It's not typically a path of success if we try to do too much too soon. In the early days of cloud computing, I saw that happen a lot. People you know, try to do these massive migrations and these massive redeployments into the cloud environment uh, at a huge amount of speed and just fail because they, they tried too much too quickly and, and they spent too much money. And obviously that was money and resources taken away from the business that could have been spent in other places. I don't think we need to make the same mistakes here. And the reality is that most enterprises have no business in building their own LLMs, like I've said here many times. Uh, people are pushing back on that. I understand why. But 
if we're looking at the pragmatic application of this technology and really getting at to the value of what AI is, it doesn't need to be trained with every piece of knowledge and do every function that needs to be done. We're able to use these things in tactical use cases and tactical ways that are able to provide more incremental value. And I think that's important. Well, that's all I have this week. Don't forget to check out my InfoWorld blog. Don't forget to uh, check out my uh, generative AI course, which is a long form entry course out on Go Cloud Careers. Also, 70 plus courses on LinkedIn Learning. Check me out there. Uh, check me out on LinkedIn, uh, on my LinkedIn profile. Check me out on X. And uh, also, don't forget about my book, The Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. Uh, I think it talks about a lot of things that we talk about here on this YouTube channel. So until next time, you guys be safe. Cheers.